opportunities that you get for playing throughout your entire career from a sixth grade band student to an 80 year old person that the trombone provides for you. You can play in virtually any type of ensemble, uh, small group jazz, classical music, chamber music, brass quintets, or you can go the route that I've gone for so much of my career is the funk R and B route and playing with name groups all over the world, basically. And my, as far as my perception, it goes as far as my career, being the son of a Native American construction worker in Southeast Texas, uh, I didn't know that you could make a career in music. I thought I was supposed to be a welder or a cowboy, quite literally. And then uh, my dad and my mom were my biggest fans uh, supporting my musical career. So my, my choices really, really broadened uh, through being a pro musician into a teacher. And the way I teach my kids about that is, you know, I've got a house, I've got a really nice truck, <laughs> you know, a boat, you know, and all my bills are paid and I have security. I don't have to depend on anybody for anything. I make mine. And that they can do it too, because I started a middle school band just like they are. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I'll kind of take the second half first. Um, my perception of of my own career, let alone you know the possibilities, has totally blown up uh, over the last couple years, especially because um, I'm born and raised in Michigan, but I just moved to Nashville about a year and a half ago. And in Michigan, I was I was doing a lot of teaching, a lot of private teaching, um, and a lot of orchestra work, but that was basically it. And I mean, I followed the traditional track. You know, I did the bachelor's degree, did the master's degree, you know, started picking up some small orchestra jobs, subbing with some bigger orchestras. Um, and I thought that was, you know, I did, I did all the stuff you're supposed to do. And that was just kind of the box that I, I allowed myself to live in. But then when I moved down to Nashville, um, it's just, I mean, it's a significantly bigger scene, a significantly more diverse scene than, than the Midwest. And so down here, I've gotten into a lot of um, recording work, um, everything from video games, pop records, um, you name it. And it's it's been it's been really eye opening for me. I knew I knew that stuff existed, but I always thought it was, you know, in these very specific pockets of the world, which it largely is. But that doesn't mean that you know you can't get into it. Um, you remind me of the first half of the question, Mary. From your beginning career to now, how is your view on um, what is capable for a trombone player to do and how do, oh, you, yeah, how yeah, do you communicate yeah. that to your students? That's right. Um, so one, the one, probably the only thing that I consciously do with my students is um, I like to tell them about the stuff that I'm doing. You know, if I'm, if I'm going to be out of town and we have to rearrange our lessons, you know, because I'm playing with an orchestra somewhere. I, I let them know that. And they think it's the coolest thing ever. Just being able to see the stuff that I'm doing. And, you know, if if I play on a video game soundtrack, and I, I like to let them know that. Because, I mean, I, I mostly teach middle school and high school uh, private lessons. And so, naturally, they play video games. So they think it is the coolest thing ever if they're playing a video game that I played on. So that that's the kind of stuff I like to do with my kids. I mean, I'm I'm working with a younger age group, so that's that's the kind of stuff that really connects with them. I uh I have to oh uh, it's the words are not coming to the mind. Um so Evan and I actually uh have a very similar track. Him and I met um each other at band camp, summer band camp in Michigan of all things, back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. And, uh, you know, we, um, him and I have stayed in touch over the years. And it's interesting, like how our two paths, like, of course we've stayed in touch, but like our two paths have kind of done this, but we're both successful at it. You know, uh, for me, I like Evan, I did the traditional track of, I went to, uh, Georgia state university for my undergraduate in jazz studies. And then I went to university of Colorado Boulder, um, which was kind of always a dream of mine because that's where the person who inspired me to play the trombone, Glenn Miller, 
went to school and then got a gig. Um, and uh, so going through that track and, and also I teach middle and high school age students. I've also done um, teaching in the private schools out here in Colorado. And it's really interesting because in Atlanta, I, I was like, cool, I'm a freelancing musician. I play gigs X, Y, Z, and I have my own little quartet and this is it. But then I come out to Colorado and it's a totally different thing. And in the back of my head, I had always wanted to play swing era music and traditional jazz. Um, and in Atlanta, we didn't have a whole lot of that going on there. Occasionally you would have some of that, but in Colorado, I get a phone call from this guy named Joe Smith and he's got a band called the Spicy Pickles of all things. And that's how that got started. So I, now I play at, you know, the Sun Valley Jazz Festival and uh, the Red Coast Festival. Um, it's uh, the Redwood Coast Jazz Festival and all these other great traditional jazz and swing festivals um, and playing for dancers. Like, I didn't think that that even happened anymore. And you get to go play for these in, before COVID, before you get to play for all these incredible dancers. And it's just a really fun time. Um, you know, and, and also like Evan, God, it's really funny how similar you and I do things. I also tell my students about what I'm doing and they think, Oh, that's really cool. We've known each other for a hundred (laughs) years. You would think, right. You know, (laughs) so, um, you know, we, uh, I, I tell my students, hey, I'm going to be out of town for the next, you know, six days or whatever, because I'm going to the Sun Valley Jazz Festival. And I tell them, oh, yeah, in Sun Valley, there's this whole movie and they get really excited about it. And then they go watch Sun Valley Serenade and they're like, I want to do the thing. And because it's great. Um, and so really showing the kids the lineage of of what we get to do as as musicians is really cool. And, and that's a huge motivating factor to them is being able to uh, being able to, to show them. I'm horrible at describing things. Um, being yeah, able to sound of a true how... teacher. You're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> on on like just the opportunities that we have. You know, I can sit in the orchestra and then I can go play in the big band, and it's a fun time. You know, both of you mentioned uh, sharing things with your students. I do that as well. Uh, I'm, I'm a big relationship guy with my kids. Uh, you know, I think that is a secret to our success, that in our culture. But uh, you know, like. I've done some TV things in the Dallas area and my assistant will turn it on whenever I'm out doing that. So the kids get to watch me live on TV or I'll tell them about the gig that I played last night or like a couple of times I had fly out gigs. I got took the red eye so I could be there for my kids the next morning. I show up in gig clothes. Where were you at, Mr. Harris? Well, I was in Scottsdale, Arizona last night playing a gig. What? And they think that's cool. Yeah, we'll go home and spend an extra 30 minutes practicing tonight and I'll tell you more about it tomorrow you know, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And, and I mean, recently, since I've been in Nashville, one of the things that, that my kids just freak out about is when they can actually, um, like see, see me play. Yeah. Um, yeah. like when I, when I've, I've, I've gotten called from the Nashville symphony a couple times and it's, I mean, and I was thankfully I've been able to pick up some tickets and, you know, my kids love it but that's something that I wouldn't be able to do normally without that connection. So, I mean, anything where my kids can see or hear me, um, whether it's sending them a YouTube link to a video game trailer, um, you know, with, with these, you know, loud, low brass chords in the background and they just mm-hmm. lose their minds. You know, it, it's any, any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, oh, it's, I it's, agree. It's one of those things like, you know, when there's this place called the Mercury Cafe here in Denver, it's one of the establishments and um, the pickles would play there all the time. And it's a family friendly place. It's really cool for kids to be there. The owner loves it. Um, And so I would tell my kids, hey, I'm playing at the Mercury Cafe on dates X, Y, Z. You should come out. I'll let you guys, you and your family in for free. It's totally cool. And these kids show up and their minds are blown. They're like, Mr. B that's my teacher. And like the next day at school, they're like, so Mr. B, what was it like? Did you see me? Da, 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 da. And it, it's just a fun time. And they, they get so pumped. And that's when they do go home and they put in that extra 30 minutes because yeah. now they have that motivating factor. We also get the parent buy-in with that too. Because mm-hmm. the parents saying, hey, look what your teacher's doing. You can do that too. Mm-hmm. It's 
I want one of our uh, attendees just to ask Travis if he could describe a little bit more about being a relationship guy. And I think this is actually, this was one of my original questions, but I think that's an important, um, as teachers, an important thing to think about as teachers, um, that relationship is so important because as you all are describing, it's your first, you know, as a trombone player, as a young trombone, pl trombone player, you as a teacher are the first insight into what the career looks like. And I mean, we're making a joke about, oh my gosh, that gig is so exciting from the perception of your students, but there's still that little kid excitement we all get when we get hired to play another gig, even if it's a crawfish boil or, you know, or, yeah. um, or you know, a crawfish something boil. crazy. Even if, like for me, the trumpet player, like the only thing that I will definitely feel disgusted at doing is having to play a horse when at a Christmas concert for some reason. That just makes me hate my job, but pretty much everything else I get really excited about. And, you know, it could be the smallest gig to the biggest gig, but the relationship side of things, and this was directed towards Travis, but Don Lucas, I know you, you've got, you have a lot to say also about your relation. Dennis Wick was Don Lucas's teacher, um, one of his major teachers. So from your guys' uh, opinion, you know, what is it about the student teacher relationship that is so valuable and creates, um, long-lasting effects on your student? Well, it's investing in their lives. I mean, anytime I'm teaching or performing, I just hear them talking to me, you know, do this, don't do that. What are you doing, boy? All the way through the years, you know, and they just, it's just an investment. It, it's such a special relationship when well, I have a friend that, uh, that says the private lesson teacher, students spend most of the time with a private lesson teacher. And it's also one-on-one. -on -one. So it's very, very personal. And, you know, an English teacher in high school or middle school, well, it's like one year and they're done, you know, but a private lesson teacher, man, they're with you for life. Even if they're not in the, in the same thing, I, I hear, I hear Dennis talking to me in the back of my mind and, and all so many people who gave so many things. Um, I wanted to, I want to touch base on what someone had said earlier about uh, Travis. You said that the parents buy in too. on a funny note. Um, I was doing a recording session in Houston. I was living in North Carolina and in the middle of the recording session, that's when there was this Australian international trombone conference. So Irv Wagner at university of Oklahoma, hooked me up and I'd been on a couple of his uh, his shows as Paul Bauer says you know the t tour but the Irv Wagner show you know he does spoons and all kinds of crazy stuff and everything and he's he's a cornerstone in trombone so I went to this flew across the world to Australia and I played a couple things on on a, on a recital but a guy showed up he was a, tr a euphonium trombone teacher his name was Tony Bishop and just one of those guys that shows up like hi I'm I'm your really good friend for the rest of your life oh nice to meet you so i hung out with him and he had a couple students there and a mother of one of the students so travis you said that like the parents often buy in in this particular case the daughter had such a great time playing trombone the mother took up trombone <laughs> also, also was studying from the teacher but seriously you guys talk about all kinds of different styles and, you know, we might've grown up playing one style or two and then something else happened and we, we got into another style. My first teacher, Dave Mazur, he played with Dorsey a little bit and Jan Savitt and Artie Shaw, you know, and, and, and different groups. And he was, he was amazing about all of those. He had played principal in a couple symphonies. And then when I stayed with him, he was a soloist in the army band in Washington DC, Pershing zone. But he was amazing about just introducing a lot of styles and that this style is this clearly delineated from this. I remember one point we were working on something swing and then later we worked on something that was like Dixie and he was just going to town on all the points of how they were different and not to confuse the styles. And uh, it made me open to a lot, a lot of different styles and try to learn them. And one of the most neglected, I think, at least in the U.S. society, is Latin. You know, you think about how, where does a kid see trombone in the public eye in the United States? Well, rarely, but here and there. And uh, boy, D Decker, if you played on the video tune, hats off, you're a superstar to all your students. For, that's it. 
But if you grew up in the Hispanic world, and we'll include Brazil with the Portuguese world, you know, the trombone is in the center of salsa and samba. It's constantly in the public eye. Not to name drop, that's not my point, but I was at a Brazil trombone conference and someone was teaching. And next to me was a, a woman in her 30s, uh, expatriate from the United States. And she said, yeah. I said, what's your story and everything? She said, yeah, I just picked up trombone during the last year. I just thought it'd be cool to play trombone. And then a Brazilian woman walked in a little bit later. She's in her mid thirties. She picked up trombone during the same year. I thought it'd be fun. I just thought that would be kind of cool if that actually happened in the United States. You know, you're lucky if you see a Texaco commercial and somebody's waving the trombone around. It's not even connected to their face and they're not even playing it. But, uh, but in samba and salsa, man, the trombone is just right center in that. And there's just so many Latin styles, you know, and I grew up playing big band and band and orchestra and then chamber music and all of it. But, you know, it's the more styles we learn, it's the more we learn about different cultures, different people. It's, it's beautiful. I'll, yeah, I'll you know, I think one of the one of the reasons we are able to do so many styles as trombone players, and that's a constantly growing field for us is because um, of the excellent work of writers and arrangers. I know, Don, you've, you've commissioned a lot of pieces, but from the arranging standpoint, one of the things that a lot of players in this group do um, is arranging. So like Quinn, I mean, I think a large part of your career is arranging for trombone and different types of ensembles. And a lot of, I mean, when I think of music arranging, I think, okay, we're gonna arrange this Star Wars theme down to brass quintet so I can play. You know? <laughs> um, but the definition of arranging for brass is really, it's a constantly growing uh, definition, I would say. And I, so we have, I mean, Chris, Bill, Paul, a lot of you are arrangers, but let's start with Quinn. Um, how, how is arranging for you as a job and for trombone players kind of opened up the world of career? Um, well, first of all, I should say that I did get um, a lot of years in high school and college listening and appreciating music and I think that's what brings people into wanting to be an arranger of sorts is because they hear how people make choices and uh, for me the arranging side professionally really picked up after I had spent some years touring and playing in bands after college so uh, I, I chalk that up to getting an opportunity uh, through um, this this guy Dan Gross who's a Berkeley College of Music alumni and he's like a film scoring major and he became a film scorer professionally and joining his team allowed me to have the most amount of arranging work that we could say is like executed on a daily basis versus say working on an arrangement that you might keep in your folder for years but when we talk about when I think about arranging these days it's about accomplishing a goal and it could be from you know Mary your thought was of taking a big piece and distilling it down to five pieces where in my eyes now that technology's taken over my idea is like how can I take the trombone and with different like in this case with different mouthpieces and different setups on my horn getting different sounds how can I actually blow up into a bigger sound how can I take a, a piano piece and make it all trombones or how can we take an uh, a choir piece and make it all trombones you know because the world has changed with the studio life in the sense that studio sessions are happening fewer and fewer uh, all around the, the the major markets in the united states for music we're talking new york nashville uh we'll clump texas together and then la and that's about it when you think about where the music industry business is and the, the, the record companies are, are making music. So there's less and less of that. And because there's less and less and we're moving into more remote worlds, I think it's opened up arranging because we're getting away from perhaps writing it down, but we now have more ability to record ourselves. And I think that's really important. Um, oh, we lost you. I know, I know. I just got like a a notification my, my apologies but yes. as arranging goes yeah i got into arranging loving slide hampton and, and loving the world of trombone stuff and then seeing how he needed 21 musicians to do that and now these days we can do it all by ourselves or like chris has done um is coordinating large amounts of people to still get together and make music and it's all possible now on such a more 
beginner level where people can have their own computers or their own cell phones and they can record things for projects, especially during a quarantine that have allowed them to get their noise to someone else who can organize it and put it out and let it be a part of the world. And that's, I think, the bigger part of arranging now is is not the preparation for an event, but to just create events as much as possible now through our different arrangements and stuff. So I like it. Um, I don't know what you guys have thought about the remote side of it, but I think because I can do so much on my end by learning trumpet or learning other brass instruments or learning other instruments in general, it just helps you become more independent. And I think your arrangements get better. Or they become more, you know, successful, I think. But I'm not the only arranger here. So. Yeah. Anybody else want to chime in? <laughs> sure. Um, my, I feel like I'm an arranger first, honestly. Like, that's the only reason anybody had ever found out about me was because of my arranging. Um, there are plenty of trombonists that are way better than me, you know, uh, at every part of what I do. Uh, but the arranging is is kind of the necessity of it. The other thing that I, I was thinking of when Quinn was talking is uh, as I s kind of found my voice in my arranging, uh, I was doing all of them myself, doing multi-tracks. And uh, it's kind of interesting because after, you know, a video does really well or some people really like the arrangement, they, of course, want, want to buy it. And my arranging style now is very specific to the medium, so to me recording all the parts. And it's, it's not a good quartet arrangement. Like if somebody wanted to buy it, which they have, and I'll, I'll actually rearrange it to be played because there are certain things that you might not think about that like just work better in a recorded fashion. So having the melody all in one part makes it very easy to mix, right? And it sounds really good. You have the background parts, just like a, a rock band. A lot of the stuff I do is pop and rock. So it's like having the melody all in one part right in the center of the mix is a good recording. But when you give that to four people to play, that means one person has the melody the whole time and <laughs> two or three people have just nothing. And it's like, that's not fun to play. It's not a good arrangement. It's it's so it, it kind of interesting to think about like the like what what are you actually going to end up with? Um, and why are you writing this piece? Is it four people to play live or not? Because that's a very different arranging style. Mm -hmm. I would think that one of the great times that we've gotten to get together is at conferences when they might have trombone ensembles that get together and do these big, large arrangements. And they're beautiful and stuff. I think it's super interesting. It's hard to recreate that, you know, um, when it comes to how you compose, you actually do compose for the venue that you're performing in. If you're going to compose music for this or that, you're going to end up uh, composing it, I think, to fit the the space, whether it's a orchestral hall or, in our case, a recording session, to where you might be able to control it more. You know. Somebody right. just asked a question. I think Quinn, maybe you could speak to. I would uh, love to. I just want to plug in my arranging across styles. Well. Oh, oh yeah, man. go ahead. Uh, you, someone grab this for five seconds. I'm sorry, I have to plug in my computer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, that's my son, not me. <laughs> Perfect. He's an 11th grader and he's just killing it. So, yeah, hook him up. Uh, so this is. Oh, I see. I see. How do you approach arranging across styles? What do you need to remember when arranging a piece for a different genre than what yeah. it, uh, than where it was originally? Um, well, I guess the first thing to think about. Um, one of the great examples I can use is I got to work on this show, Drunk History, which is. Um, a very uh, tongue-in-cheek approach to telling history. And so what that equals is the music is very tongue-in-cheek. We might bring in music from a different era and put it into a new style, which is exactly what you're asking about. So in this case, my number one thing as a person with a job in arranging is to get it done at a timely phase. So I think priorities are important to remember about arrangements, like your, your melody, and your form. I think form is actually something that people, um, form is something that people don't know that they're remembering, but they're actually kind of taking cues from. Um, a great example would be the AABA form of jazz standards as we know them. 
that cyclical nature is something that they, uh, the listener at that time in that era expected. Um, so when someone like Thelonious Monk presented really obscure, intervallic new melodies that had not been accepted by the general public yet, he put it inside a form that was very accepted, that A-A-B-A -A -A form, and it was something that the ear could grab onto and follow along with. So when we take new music, like say taking an old song and let's put it in a hip hop style or let's put it with a big beat or an EDM drop in the middle of it. You know, for me, I like to think about the form of the piece and making sure that the ear is ready to expect what it expected in the original. Um, and I think that as a younger person, you should certainly think about taking this on smaller levels. Like, can I take a piece that was a rock song and turn it into something that's more say funky or can I take a classical song and do one thing differently about it and try and change my growing you know my ability and to to make the arrangement sound unique to me um, and a lot of times that one change is all that we have time to do in the real world and other times it's the only thing you need to do to find a really different and unique approach to it um, one great thing is choosing your instruments I would say that's probably the first thing we do that decides if we're going to take it into a different part of the world is what instruments are we using for our arrangement and i think that has really helped me um and as trombone players you're always arguing that they needs to be a trombone in the song um which it does so like you're always trying to say this is a, no this is a trombone from russia this is a trombone from brazil this is a trombone from arkansas you know this is my trombone sound we need this instead of that guy's trombone or this person's trumpet we don't need any of that. We need just trombones to figure out. You can make that by just coming from a different part of the world with that idea. And I think that's really important is the instruments you use when you start arranging is that can really change the sound of a, a song so quickly. Yeah, I think kind of just jumping off of that with the form being the thing that the ear is locking on to with these like new styles of arrangements, not just form, but anything like any cliche you can actually like pull into that listeners would know. I mean, I do a lot of funk arrangements of of pop tunes or whatever it is. Uh, the other one I did a bunch of was like, uh, I guess cinematic, like superhero theme version of pop tunes. And it's like any cliche that you've heard before, you kind of have to play into those. It can't be like, oh, this is like a new thing that you've never heard before because now it's not that new, <laughs> that style that you're trying to do. So all of the cliches uh deck or maybe even you could talk about like the trad jazz stuff where it's like there's stuff that just happens every time and if you can put that in like the listener is gonna know yeah in in traditional in the at least in the traditional jazz idiom you know if you include oh yeah that's you know king oliver a little snippet of king oliver solo people immediately attach to that they're like whoa that's you know that's cool you know so little things like that it makes it makes you translatable you know you're trying to as musicians we want to reach people and we want to change people's lives but if we're speaking a language that they don't understand or if we're not providing a good story you know how are they gonna you're just you know you're providing them entrances to to connect with you and i, I have such a hard time like for those of you in conservatory right now or music school it is just ripe with people who want to be so like oh, he's gone mainstream faux pas, or oh, he's copied this faux pas. You know, it's just, and that irked me back then, like, because, you know, we don't need to be, we don't need to be mainstream or copiers or whatever to, to appreciate other people's music and the work we're doing ourselves. We're just, you know, you're, you're complimenting them and you're, you're making, you're translating whatever you're doing new to somebody who's never heard you before. Um, but I think it's important too to, you know, we've got the idea that at this clinic, we've talked to a, um, a bunch of band directors. And I know that Travis, when we did our productions meet, production meetings, it was, I asked Travis, what is important for a band director when they're coming in and talking to their, their young kids? And he was, he mentioned several things, but one of the things he mentioned about was how you can basically, you know, how we can help the community and help these, music, these young students get an appreciation for music. And I think it's important to say that, you know, a lot of the videos I see people putting up now, if they're gonna be playing trombone or playing clarinet or playing bassoon or playing the, that four tom thing that you, that you walk around on the field with, like that, those people are actually taking songs that they listen to 
they're not taking repertoire, but they're taking new songs from new eras and different places that don't have clarinets in them and don't have trombones. And they're finding a way to play the melody or they're finding a way to play something in the song. And I think that's super crucial from a band director standpoint to realize that, you know, it may not, might not be an arranging question, but it might just be a, can you use your interest in music to find your own place in a different style? You know, and I think that's something really key uh, for younger musicians and for older band directors who were able to rely previously on like competitions. I feel like competitions were so much more common than they are now. And the idea of going in and working up a piece and getting to compete and, and travel and see other people, I just feel like it doesn't happen as much. So the, the where do you get a, a kid hooked on music to want to keep growing with it, you know, is I think an important question. Yeah, I really like what you're saying there too, because it, in Texas is the epitome of band competition at every level and i know my group is one of the, is very good at it or at least until covid have been really good and successful at it but we sometimes uh we uh, on the educators uh end of it seem to sometimes we lose sight of the genesis of what we're doing which is entertainment and whenever i was a high school director i made sure that we had a competition show but we also had a show for the fans the people who are paying the bills. And at the middle school level, you know, I'm a middle school director because I want to be a middle school director. Because I, if you're a high school director, you can't play. You know, think about Friday night football games. But it comes time, uh, who, who am I playing for? Am I playing for me or, or, or am I playing for my audience? And I've also been lucky enough to be a mu the musical director in every one of the pop gigs that I've done. And I've been with some, you know, some really, outstanding groups here in the Dallas area. You know, one tune of sets for the band, everything else is for the people who are paying the bills. You know, how many people have played uh, play that funky music, White Boy or Brick House so much that you want to throw up every time you hear it. But it jam they, uh, they jam pack the dance floor every time you play it. So we have to always remember that, you know, we're, we're entertainers in playing for an audience and competition isn't the end all be all. Something very short to add with that. Years ago when I was teaching in public school, I had a parent come in. The parent was uh, rather famous and was only involved in classical music and basically uh, railed on the fact that I was playing pop music included in with that particular public school music program. And I'm not assailing him per se, but his vision was narrow and if we include music that the students know and can relate to, they're more open to grasp and embrace a lot of other myriad styles. I, I have to agree with, with what Don just said as well. Um, you know, when I was in high school, we in Georgia, competition is also very much a big thing. There was marching band and there was concert band competition prep. That was the only two things. I had to go to another high school, leave my high school early to go to another high school just to be in a jazz band because, well, there was no jazz band competition. So why on earth would we ever do that? But it's like, I wanna play jazz, right? And so, you know, knowing your audience and also, you know, instead of just playing um, this one very obscure piece because it's on the approved list of competition tunes. I mean, I'm pretty sure I played the same Samuel Hazo songs every year in high school concert band because, and Sam Hazo is a great composer and amazing arranger and a, a phenomenal clinician. Um, but we like, that was on the GMEA approved list. And so that's all we ever played, but it, it, so yeah, it's, it's just one of those things you have to know your audience and you also have to know like, cool, there's a time for competition, but also let's remember why we're doing this. Yeah, I, I'd like to jump in on that just really, really quickly. Uh, that's where it's our responsibility as educators to pick out tunes that are all, all round, well-rounded tunes, not only for competition and concert, but also teaching tools. Yep. So they understand what they're doing but also pick material that the kids enjoy playing. Yep. 
you know, uh, in, you know, right at the top of where you want them to be. You don't want to pick things that are out completely out of their grasp, but how many of us at some point band directors pick something that we didn't want to go home and practice. And that's mm -hmm. not the way you grow a, or cultivate a program or cultivate lifelong learners. So that's our responsibility to pick out good music that's teaching tools, but also that the kids want to play and practice. Yep. Totally agree. I did have one question for TJ. TJ, you play in a brass band that is amazing. And it's incredible what they do with their arrangements because you certainly cover songs and not oh, just yeah. originals. Uh, what do you take from their arrangements? And it's something that kids should check out. If they haven't heard the Dirty Dozen Brass Band yet, you got to get into that music because um, it's been around for 30 years? Oh, yeah. 40, 40? Four years. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But that arrangements are all brass bands playing covers and playing originals, and they're all based on a roots music, which is American roots music, which has a role playing aspect to it, I would say too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the, actually what you, what you said, Quinn was exactly how the dirty dozen got started where their, their whole purpose, well, I shouldn't say purpose, but like the whole premise behind it was they were literally getting together, playing the stuff that they heard on the radio and not playing just the traditional, uh, traditional jazz stuff that was happening here in New Orleans or your typical second line brass band music. They were playing other things and that kind of spiraled into everything else that you see now. But I mean, they're still staying true to it. We, we literally will get a call about, you know, a specific gig and the promoter, uh, you know, this song is very special to them. Let's do a cover of it. Mm. And we're working on the cover. And it, now the, the, the thing I would say uh, in regards to arranging for your particular ensemble is know your ensemble and I, I know I know that that has been said but you have to know your ensemble um you, you, Jeffrey Jeffrey and I were in a rehearsal last night with Delphio and you know Delphio writes certain things for specific people and if a certain person will not be on that gig that will not be played because it is for them because of how they will present it to the audience and I think that's right. very important when you're doing that for small groups, large ensembles, anything, if you have the privilege to know your audience, I mean, know, know who's in your in your ensemble, write for them. It, it is really okay. And I know that's that's also a, a thing that we don't necessarily uh, see a lot, especially in, in, in academia, because you never know who's gonna be there next year. You don't know if this student is out, if they're, yeah, we've had 15 rehearsals, they could be sick. Their parent could say they're staying home. You know, I understand that. But when we're doing it outside of that, I really, really think that that's the thing that we should be driving home. Like, understand who's in who's in your ensemble. If you, if your trombone player is really good at playing pedal tones, there's no reason why they sh they should not be playing pedal tones at some point in this concert, or in, you know, on this on this particular tune. If your trumpet player is amazing at plunger trumpet stuff, with all due respect, you know, maybe not give it to the trombone player. If the trumpet if the trumpet player is great at it, let them do it. But that's that's one of the things, and I said that to say that's one of the things about the Dirty Dozen is, you know, everyone has their thing that is Roger Lewis on the Barry saxophone. Man, if you hear him pop those those low notes at his, I mean, he has that low A that he always plays, bro. If you hear him play it, I haven't. You you don't hear anyone else in the world play that like that. So when we get a chance, oh yeah, by all means, Roger, please hit that, and I want you to hit it the way you always do. Don't don't shy away. Smack it in the face, like bam. I want. I want to continue yeah, yeah. talking arranging, um, but we've got a lot of other questions. It's yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of interest in, um, there's been a couple of questions on studio work um, and yeah. getting into studio work and, you know, gigging, live gigging, which is not a whole going on a lot right now, but is is something that's definitely going to come back. And so while you're on, you know, TJ, while, while you're on the Dirty Dozen Brass Band, I know you and Jeffrey and quite a few of you um, do a lot of live performance um, that maybe you've arranged for, but we're going to move on to live performance. I just wanted to, to give some of the younger students an idea of how you got to what you were doing, the connections you made along the way, the communities that you maybe tapped into to get where you're going. Um, one specific question is about how do you get into studio playing? Like, how do you, do you contact the studios? So um, let's get into some career talk here in terms of studio and live playing. Um, and TJ, why don't, you, why don't you start? Okay, well, in regards to studio playing, a lot of the studio work that I've done down here in New Orleans has been as a result of me playing 
with someone that is in an ensemble or something like that. So really, um, my 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 advice to people who are interested in doing that is is get on just the the performing scene in general, um, because to be honest, no one's going to know if you're going to be able to sight read this part unless I've heard you play before. I mean, I'm not saying that that does not happen where you don't just get a call and no, then no one knows you and you step in the room. But for the most part, it is because someone has heard or seen you play before. So I really say get in, you know, get into the scene. And right now it's it's kind of unfortunate, but we do have a lot of of, uh, of measures of, you know, how uh, Chris and, and Paul and a lot of you guys really, you know, arranging things and then people being able to hear you play do that uh, in regards to just like the performing scene in general i think uh, mary you hit on it like the connections that are made because to be honest with you um and everyone i'm sure everyone in in this uh, on this panel and and watching will agree that uh playing music is more than just playing the notes it's it's very very personal so being a good person and what that means really and i, I heard heard a uh another uh Dennis Wick artist say this, uh, she's a trumpet player. She's like, realize that everyone is human. So everyone has something, even though we're all in this, in this building from two to six or whatever, everyone, when they step out, has something that they're dealing with. So, so just, you know, be human and understand that it's not, yes, it's work. And yes, we want to get this done, but everyone is a human being and they have their own things that you will not know about. If you do that, it's really easy to be a good person. And all of the things that you worked on in the practice room, and at home and in your studio, yada, 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 those things will come together and you'll see that it works out. But generally, you know, we, we, we like to talk a lot about the side of the horn and not the other side. I mean, just being next to a person for, for two days, you know, or, or being on a tour bus, for example, you know, being out like that, you, you gotta be a nice person. I mean, you guys are living on a bus for, for you know, three weeks. That's not easy. But understanding, like I said, that everyone's human. Everyone has something that they're going through. And I'm not saying that it's bad. I mean, people could be, life could be great for them. But just just being being a nice person, those are the things that I really believe keep you on gigs. The horn gets you in the door, but who you are keeps you there. Yes, can I, uh, yeah, I would love to, I would love to harp on yeah. that as well. That's so, so, so true. Um, it's It's really, really important that you are like you just said a good person that people enjoy uh being around you right they don't that you don't take away uh from the vibe the pre-existing vibe right that if anything you know if anything you add to it in a in a non-invasive way right or not invasive way excuse me um and you know that's not to say you know don't sacrifice you know be yourself of course but definitely when you find yourself if you find yourself when you find yourself in, in those situations um it's just very important to i feel like you know uh be i feel like it's always it's always safe to start more on the conservative side in terms of you know you don't want to be overly overly friendly and overly you know jovial if you're in a new situation right because you might freak some people out right but you don't want to you know but you also don't want to be an, you know to be a jerk you know or be an a-hole forgive my you know pardon my french or anything you know you want to you want to just be be a cordial human being you know what i mean and uh you know be a cordial human being and and you know just be be easy going and be easy to work with and easy to talk to and uh be easy to uh be open to you know anything that people are telling you because you you know you're you're the new person in the situation right so uh for example you know actually harping on that that road example that she did was talking about i did a, I did a your i did half of a europe european tour with uh winton and jazz and lincoln center uh orchestra and i only did half of the or i was subbing for elliot mason i only did half of the the tour but it felt like the longest two and a half weeks of my life because of the the road not in a bad way i mean not in terms of what anybody on in the band did but just in terms of travel you know what i mean so it's just really important to uh uh to keep in mind you know i was the in that case i was the the new guy in that situation you know i was the i was the i was the the 
the sub. I was the guy who was filling in, right? And, you know, those guys, those guys knew me and everything, but it was still, you know, you have to keep in mind what other people are, you know, they've, they've been through this before, so you have to sort of, you know, follow their lead in terms of, uh, you know, how to handle certain situations and, and just, you know, be cool, be chill, and just go with the flow. And, uh, yeah, just be open and just communicative and, and just, you know, let your, your playing will speak for itself, of course, but also just be open and be, be you know, yeah. just be a nice person. Just be, I, be I, chill. Be cool. For those who may be curious of how you get on a gig, um, that is, I know that I, I get that question a lot when I do some master classes or even with my, with my private lesson students, you know, like, well, how do I, how do I get this gig? Or how, you know, in a situation where there is not an open call and you can go do an audition, uh, well, I'll just put it like this. The way I got in a Dirty Dozen was I was playing, already playing with Delphio's big band. And um, Roger Lewis, who is a founding member in a Dirty Dozen, also plays Barry in the big band. But the way I got on the on Delphio's big band gig was I literally set in on the gig one day. So um, I'm saying that to say, like, there is no cut and dry, this is how it's going to happen being prepared musically and and if you're not if, if you don't know what to do that's also fine you know if let's say you really want to there's a vacancy in something you know that it's coming up but you have no idea what they're looking for yada, yada that's okay and it is really okay to ask it is fine to ask that's so you know sometimes a taboo thing but it's okay to ask someone who's a genuine you know g nice genuine human being they're not going to take that the wrong way they may not have the answer for you but it's okay to just ask, hey, you know, what are you guys looking for? If you were going to hire a, a bass trombonist, what would you be looking for? It's better to ask and to possibly get an answer than to just sit there and hope that it comes up. But I say all of that to say, you know, again, there's no like cut and dry. This is what's going to happen. I'm sure all of these guys have different stories about how they got on a random gig and like, oh, man, now it's working out for me. That happens all the time. And, you know, as encouragement, it will happen in, in due time. Like those things come to you. Just stay on your horn and, you know, keep listening to all of the different types of music. I would like to put a little plug here. Listening to all types of music is really what makes you a, a well-rounded musician. It does not matter if your if your ideal situation is to be the bass trombonist in the New York field. Listen to more than just excerpts i mean you really want to be well-rounded because you never know what happens after that let's say you get the new york field job and then they call you, someone calls the low brass section or the trombone section from new york field to do something and it's a funk thing and now you're totally out of your wheelhouse you don't want that to happen because truth be told people are going to talk and it's not going to be really really bad they're just going to say hey yo bro you know next time if we get you let's call such and such instead so listen to a lot of different music. Don't don't be in your in your own little bubble. Put your ear on a lot of things because the truth of the matter is that the world is really really massive and there's a lot of music out there happening. Yeah, yeah. and with yeah, what yeah. TJ said too, man, like that's that's there's no such thing in the all the things you're listening to. There's no such thing as bad music, right? I hear a lot of people, oh yeah, my grandparents used to watch Lawrence Welk. That's an awful show, but that's one of the best trombone section sounds I think I've ever heard. Pete Lofthouse is an amazing bass trombonist. Bob Havens is phenomenal. You know, there's no such thing as listening to the bad music or, oh, that's hokey or, you know, that's so cheesy that you would, you know, listen to the, you know, good old Bob Havens, you know, there's nothing wrong with that because it's great stuff. It's all music and we all love that stuff. So listen to everything. Yeah. Can I, I want, chime in? Oh, yeah. uh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh no! Yeah, I was just gonna say really, really quick to bounce off of what TJ was saying about you know how to how to quote unquote get a gig or land a gig or whatever. Um, I think it's really important if you have your sights set on playing with a specific artist or um, or or connecting with a specific artist or working with a specific artist. Um, definitely, you know, you may do this already, but make sure that you you know as much as you can about them or familiarize yourself as much with your music. Or with their music, um, the story that comes to mind instantly is is I was in my second year, first or second year at, at Juilliard uh, undergrad, and I at this point I was listening so much to uh, 
to Christian McBride's one of Christian Christian McBride's big band albums, right? And uh, I was in my dorm at Juilliard, and I had just gotten I had just eaten dinner, and I got a call from my teacher James Burton, who was playing uh, in the band. I believe he still plays in the band now, but he was playing third trombone in the band right now. And he told me, he texted me, "Hey, Steve Davis is running late. Uh, could you run over to Dizzy's right now? Hit the make the first set with the Christian McBride big band." And I was like. Yeah, I'll be over there. I'll get dressed. I'll I'll make it. And it's crazy because I was literally listening to the specific album. Uh, I forget the name of it. I think it was The Good Feeling, maybe. But I was listening to the specific album so much that I, I knew I knew the trombone part. I knew the whole, I knew all the arrangements just because I love the music so much, right? And so when I was able, and I was sitting in for Steve Davis, I was reading his book, I was reading his book, and I didn't really have to, read like that because i knew the music so much i was so familiar with the music that i barely had to read you know what i mean so it's like one of those things where you know opportunity meets preparation kind of thing mm -hmm. and also on a, a different note with that is also when person that artist in person uh or even on social media you know but especially in person um it would help to not always you know come off as a as a you know, a fan, you may be a super fan of that, of that artist, right? I'm a big fan of Christian McBride, but you want to more, more so come off, uh, make sure you, they know that you have that respect for them, right? First, as opposed to just coming off as an, as a fan, right? Because it's, it's that you want them to see you in a, in a, in a mature professional light, right? So that they, they're like, okay, that, that person, that kid, or, or that person is a, is a fan of the music clearly and he also just has a has a really good head on his or her or their shoulder right they they can carry themselves in a specific way and they they you know they're like i said they're good people they they seem like they carry themselves in a way that you know i could see me higher than hiring them one day if i can hear them play and i like how they sound right you just want to come off um respectful and and prepared so that's my tidbit of information Paul, what were you going to say? Because my next yeah, question Paul is for you too. So yeah, you, so as, as far as like breaking into studio work, I'll just kind of explain how I kind of organized that. So when you think about who's going to hire you for a studio session, it's either going to be a contractor, a producer, or you're subbing for somebody that gave your name out. So those are your points of entry, right? So what you want to do is first you want to study with those that are already doing the work, because if you take care of business and you know how to play, they're going to pass you some of that work. Right. And then the other way and the way I, I did it actually was I became friends with producers and I became friends with contractors. And how did I become friends with them? I hired them for work. I hired them for work first. They knew what I could do. And then they hired me for their work. Like, That's how I did it. And then you, once they at war with you, they trust you. When you hire them first, they're going to hire you for their work. So just kind of like a, maybe a different way to think about it. If I could jump in real quick on this. Um, so my my path to studio work was, was different than everyone else's, but it goes back to when I was a student at a summer festival. Um, I went to the Cleveland Trombone Seminar several times. And then in 2016... Shakar Israel, who's an assistant principal trombone in the Cleveland Orchestra, needed a sub last minute, and he runs the Cleveland Trombone Seminar. So he, he called me for that, and this was 10 p.m. on a Monday night. First rehearsal was 10 a.m. in Cleveland, and I lived in Chicago. So, uh, you know, I went, played that week. They asked me back that summer, and then when I moved down here to Nashville um, in 2019, some friends of mine who are in the studio scene down here recommended me to the major contractors. They you know, went to what went to my website, read my bio, saw that I played with the Cleveland orchestra and that gave them enough credibility to feel good about hiring me along with the personal recommendations. But it came back to like, all of this over the last, a lot of what I've done over the last four or five years comes back to that call from Cleveland, either directly or indirectly, and that came from building a great relationship from a summer festival. So especially for 
older high school and, and college students, build those relationships at festivals, both with the students and with the faculty, because you never know where it's going to come back to, to help you out. Yeah, if, if I could really quick, just another tidbit uh, off what Evan said, building those relationships is, is really, really, really a big deal. Um, I, I, I'm glad Paul said something about the contractors because that had totally left my mind. But I, I also play bass and, and I subbed for about two and a half weeks on the touring musical, uh, The Bodyguard. And I literally got the call from a friend of mine that I did not meet in college. He had already graduated, but he came back and heard me play. And we were literally just kind of standing outside of the music building talking for what ended up being a couple of hours. And that musical came to New Orleans and he called me and said, hey man, are you guys playing anywhere? We're gonna be here for the week. Oh yeah, man, of course. Come on out, bam, 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 get you in on the show. And literally that next Saturday, his father passed away and he called me and told me, hey, you're going to get a call. The contract is going to call you now. Also, what Jeffrey is saying is it, it gratefully. So I knew a lot of the music from the bodyguard. So hearing all of these Whitney Houston songs, like I knew those songs. So although I was really sight reading the other cues and stuff in the book, the stuff for the, you know, just the songs, bam, I knew how to play those. I was reading, so I know where we cut off, but it, in regards to the song, I knew it. But I'm saying all of that to say the relationships are a big deal. I saw someone in the chat say something about, uh, you know, toxic uh, competitiveness. And that's a thing that we, I'm sure everyone has had to deal with. And what I have deduced it to is a, and I, I don't, I don't want to be a, a downer here, but I've deduced it to it being a lack of, uh, of security in yourself. Uh, Jeffrey Miller and I, for example, both play plunger trombone all the time. We literally sat in a rehearsal last night where on in this suite of music, we both are going back and forth, not at the same time, but in this movement, I'm playing it, this movement, he's playing it. He plays the way he plays and I play the way I play. I love the way he plays. I love the way I play. There's no, I mean, there's, TJ's better though. <laughs> stop it there is you know i'm sure that there's that little sense of like oh he just killed that so i gotta make sure i'm i'm on it but there's there's you know being very secure in yourself and i think the way you do that is you 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 don't you don't allow yourself to lie to yourself if there's something that you need to work on be honest with yourself about it work on it if there's something that you're not sure about seek out information ask people I, i'll tell you uh, anyone who's attending all of us on here we will be willing to answer any question if you hit us up. We're really an open book, and that's a beautiful thing about you know this group of people. And and really, when you when you get into the to the industry, you realize that almost everyone is like that. It's it's the stories you hear about it being like, oh, that person is really mean. I don't want to step up to them, or I heard this story. Those people exist, but they are the true minority. That's like four percent of the industry. So reach out to people, ask them questions. Yeah, I, can I say one quick thing? that it's like the contractors too it's like really developing a genuine relationship because they'll you know they're music contractors you know they they know they can sus they're usually good at sussing out when people are just being nice to them just to you know get a gig right they can tell they can tell when you're being fake and you don't really mean you know that you don't really care about them you care about what they can do for you right, right? so it's so so important just to be you know going back to being a really good person you know what I mean? Because they'll be able to tell that you're genuine and, and, you know, you may not care about them. You may not, but you never know what you, you know, just like, for example, um, I developed a really good relationship with, um, ended up developing a really good relationship with uh, the contractor at the Colbert Show, right? Um, and this was after I, John had, John Batiste had recommended me to, to sit in in the hospital, right? This is the, after the first time. But so I met him in person and, and we just hit it off just as people. Right. And we check in personally every, you know, every now and then. Right. And you never know what comes from that. Like he just hit me up, uh, the other day to do a, to do a thing a com coming up on the Colbert show. So it's like one of those things where he just literally hit me up like, Hey, I was just randomly thinking about you. I hope you're doing all right. And like, also while this is, while I'm texting you just to say, just to catch up and say, hello, uh, this thing is come, this thing might be coming up. Uh, just seeing if you're available just in case it pulls up, you know, just in case it uh, is ends up coming around and, and happening. So it's one of those things where you're just literally 
uh, forming genuine relationships with people, right? Because usually they're in an industry where a lot of people like to use each other for personal gain, right? So it's like they'll be able to tell when you're not being yourself, when you're not being genuine, and you're just you know being fake. So it's it's really important to to uh, be a good human being and just be genuine with with wanting to bond with people and wanting to connect with people. It's really really important. We need to move on to some attendee yeah, questions sorry. that were, no, no, you, this is great. And I wish we had more time and I would allow us to go on longer, but I've got a tuba talk that starts it uh, in about an hour and I need to, <laughs> I need to cut this off by 1230. Um, one thing I did want to say, because this, this question, this discussion came up in uh, our women and brass discussion, but mentorship, you know, and, and I think one of the one of the pieces of advice I give to all my students and all my the kids I give clinics to is you never know who you're sitting next to. A lot of the people that these guys have been talking to that and telling stories about are very recognizable in the industry. But a lot of your greatest assets are people that are not recognizable at all. Like I really like the career path I've taken, and it's all due to playing in a brass quintet that everybody in my grad school was turning their nose up to because it wasn't big time enough. And that was the beginning to my, the very twisty road of my career path to doing what I'm doing. Um, but you never know who you're talking to and mentorship is huge. You know, just, you don't need to look for the, you know, the best friend of John Baptiste or, you know, or, you know, or the connection to whatever big group that you want to, your end goal. You need to look in your hometown and the, the, the places you are and who inspires you. Ask them out to coffee, get to know as many people on their roads. And it's a sign, you know, it humbles you to teach you more about, what everybody else has been through. And it that's a beginning to relationships too that might lead to those bigger named ones down the line. But you know, the more people who inspire you, talk to them, get to know them. I'm hoping everybody here has inspired you today as well, which is another plug. I, I will be starting some Facebook groups with each of these individual talk sessions we've had. So um, everybody who's here, I will, will be invited to it. So it's a great way to continue this discussion also. And I think we'll be doing this on a quarterly basis also. So maybe the next discussion and, you know, in the new year we'll do on arranging, because that seems like a subject that we could have talked a lot more on. Um, but let's move on. I, I did want to, I had a specific question for Chris Bell and Paul now because, or Paul the trombonist, because both of you are such online personalities and there's, I'm sure some people here who, um, I've been curious about how to get more involved there. Um, one of the questions that I think you guys can maybe speak to is how do you stand out online? Everything we're doing right now, we, we've like, this is, I think, amazing. We've basically not talked about COVID for about an hour straight, which I don't know for all of you is pretty, is like Record. something to be proud of. <laughs> but Let's bring it into the discussion. Everything is pretty much gone virtual. How do you stand out as an educator? How do you stand out as a performer? How do you create a product that is going to set you apart from everything else that's going on right now? So I stood out by changing my name to Paul the Trombonist and holding a giant stuffed banana. <laughs> that's why I did Legendary. it, to get attention. <laughs> Legendary. Um. It's a, it's a, it's a really important question. Uh, I, I think there's a few different like thoughts that come to mind. One is no matter how much you try to be like somebody else, you'll still be yourself. You know, like I, I had a conversation with my, it's funny to end embarrassing to talk about now, but with my, uh, college professor Tim Albright, where I was, I was studying a lot of JJ and I was like, I feel like like my licks, they sound like too much like JJ. He goes, if you go to a gig and somebody says you sound like JJ, that's a really good place to start. <laughs> like oh right he goes and don't worry <laughs> like <laughs> you won't <laughs> um so i don't know like um you're going to be have your own voice uh but the the biggest thing for me was just combining my passions so that's that's how you stand out like for me my it wasn't like i want to be a symphony player but i'll settle for like <laughs> doing youtube videos with pop tunes no like my passions were mainstream music and technology and video editing and marketing and yes trombone and arranging like i combined everything into what i already like now what you see i do it makes sense but that those passions will be different for everybody so find out all those things and, and squish them together in a really awkward way a friend of mine loves heavy metal music and he's a classical trumpet player and so he transcribes these like ridiculous guitar solos on trumpet and it's super niche 
and he found a bass clarinet player who does the same thing. And he and so you find your little community once you combine these passions and aren't just trying to do like the mainstream thing. That's like we're already playing trombone; it's not going to be mainstream. So find your little community, uh, and you will stand out because you'll find the people that are just like you. The thing I always say is is make something or do something that you would love if you weren't the one doing it. So you would find it instantly and like give them all your money. So yeah. Chris and Paul, if you guys were gonna make one, like your first step in the, that direction today, like what would be your first thing? Would it be to go buy the banana or would it be to figure out your passions or what, what, what do you think is like the first thing people start doing at this point? I would think about like, how do you want to brand yourself, right? How do you want to kind of separate yourself from someone else and go all in on the branding, like hammer it. Your, your, your logo shows up everywhere. Paul the trombonist, boom, you know, like constantly where it's just like so embedded in people's mind where they just recognize that branding. They'll see the logo, they recognize your brand. And if you just hammer it and hammer it and you're consistent, and you just never stop with it and you keep putting content out there, people are going to resonate with it. Yeah, I would say uh, distill it down to one sentence. And it's really hard to do for musicians. You go, look, I'm a multi-instrumentalist. I do this, I do that, I do arranging and like a uh, marketing consultant, like distill it down to one sentence. Like I'm a YouTube trombonist or whatever it is. Like if you, if you pick that one thing that's more important than the rest and it's hard to do, uh, then that will be a lot easier because now you're just saying like, what's your, your pitch to somebody? Like, here's what I do, done. Um, and the more times you say that, the repetition, uh, it becomes true. And also it just like dedicating resources and time to that thing that is going to be the most important. You're not spreading yourself so thin and you're kind of dedicating yourself to learning more about that and uh, becoming like a true, um, I don't know, like part, you know, like carving out your, your corner of the industry, I guess, just yeah. becoming somebody who is like knows a lot about that one thing. And one thing Chris and I do. Yeah. It just seems like an affirmation on that. Because my kid is an 11th grade trombone player and he's very serious about it. He wants to grow up and be in the era of note. He wants to go to UNT and major in jazz studies. He knows every video that Paul and Christopher has done. Not only does he know it, all of his buddy knows, all of his buddies know it too, because they talk about it. They see all the cool multi-trombone things that Christopher does. He's watched the watchers thing that Paul has done about a hundred million times. It's that big word of mouth once you get this kid plugged into it. So yeah, whatever you're doing, it's working. I mean, Paul and I are also lucky because we started out like before anybody did it. Like when I started, Paul was literally the only other one doing it. So like now if I had to start today, kind of to answer your question, Quinn, I don't think I would start on YouTube. I think I would start on TikTok, you know, like I would start on something that is is new and accessible and easy to be shared um, and digestible, like, like TikTok. That's just the way people are consuming stuff today versus when we started, it was YouTube. So, and obviously it still is, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think it, it changes as, as you go over time, like we will be completely old news and there'll be somebody on TikTok none of us have ever heard of and has, you know, billions of views, so. When you guys got started, um, I'm guessing there was mentors along the way also. Um, as far as the internet goes, I mean, I probably put up my first video in 2006 or seven. So there wasn't really a path there yet. But as far as trombone playing, yeah, of course. Uh, Phil Wilson, one of my dear mentors, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, honestly, I'm, I'm with Paul here. Like plenty of trombone mentors, nobody for the internet. I mean, we, the only reason I was making videos was because I didn't get a gig yet. <laughs> like, it was something to do, a project to, to put together. Uh, but also taking it seriously, which is, is really important if you're doing something creative as like a side project or especially if you're in school, like I was in, in college, I had the time to dedicate to this stuff and put my whole heart and soul and time and money into it. I guess not really money, just more time uh, to take it really seriously. Yeah, if you want it to work, you gotta do what Chris did. You gotta really go all in, you know? It's, you gotta be consistent. You gotta constantly upload content. A lot of people will say, 
yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to put out the videos and I'll put like one video up and then they kind of burn out, you know, but to really make it grow into a career, you really got to be consistent with it and just go all in. And if you, if you treat it part-time, you're going to get part-time results. If you treat it full-time, you're going to get full-time results. Yeah. Most people don't have the time to dedicate to it, but it, it does take that. I was making videos for four years before anybody saw any of them. I mean, so that's the truth of the matter. I have a, a comment about Paul is, is I went to school with Paul in Boston and I got to work with Phil and we heard about Don across the street. <laughs> you know, there, there's 10,000 music students in a square mileage in Boston. That's incredible. And we're all trying to study stuff, but Paul, before the internet had blown him up, he was just a music student and he was just going to the Berkeley College of Music. He was playing trombone. But from that day, one that I met him, he was still an enthusiast of the trombone. He was still someone that wanted to talk trombone that wanted to do interviews with Phil and other great people and collected records and collected CDs and collected, I assume other things that like were recorded media, but like he was already started on this path of, he was a, a full-time trombone enthusiast, which I really thought when he started putting out the videos and they made it to my desktop, it meant that like he had channeled something else that he had that was really awesome about music and found a way to move that into a technical world and make videos so that it got out to more people. But I remember when you were graduating college, Paul, you were doing a, you did a great senior recital. And I remember you were telling me about a record you had found of Phil's that was like unreleased and it would not been out in forever. And you found it and you bought it and you gave it to Phil as a gift. Like that kind of attitude is what fuels this video, video making, I assume, correct? Oh yeah. You guys have mentioned Phil Wilson now three times, so mm-hmm. he's a, a huge stone in 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 my life as well. Uh, when would you say, uh, Derek, when dinosaurs were running around? Uh, somebody did. Um, I studied with Phil, did a seven week summer session, and uh, that was a, a great session. But uh, he was on an ITA uh, uh, kind of a meeting thing a few weeks ago, and it was nice to see him. And certainly, we all have different cornerstones who've m- who invested in all of our lives. You know, how about during this COVID time? How about we reach out to uh, Dennis and and Phil and several others of our cornerstones, and uh, just just let them know we we're, we're we're still appreciating what they did, invest in our lives, and we're trying to do that kind of thing with our lives. Great. I think that's a great idea. Uh, we have one more time for one more question, which is our last question that I received uh, ahead of time. Um, and I'm going to start this with Crystal because I, I kind of know the answer. It's a funny story, <laughs> from what I remember. Um, but uh, this attendee wanted to know um, when on your path, professionally speaking or teaching, when is it most important to decide what it is you want to do and how would you know? And I know from our our uh, our podcast, Chris, that at one point you were going to quit. And so like your whole podcast was quit or keep going. But I think that was kind of in my, in my from my, what I understood to be, that was kind of your defining point of like figuring out what you wanted to do or the first starts. But we'll start with Chris. Everybody else chime in. Where uh, where can they listen to that? Uh, <laughs> you can listen to uh, all the podcasts. Uh, with, uh, <laughs> the app. App. There it is. I was waiting for somebody to do it. Yeah. yeah. The Dennis Wick app. app. And you can Don't find the app. full library of Dennis Wick podcasts that include. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's an ever-growing library and if there's something you want us someone you want us to interview if there's a subject you can always you know reach out and suggest it but there's a lot of great stuff including one a podcast with Chris Bell and with actually quite, quite a few other of you on, on work on the podcast team so you can I think hear all of these guys at some point on a podcast but anyway so uh, the question is how to like when you realize your path when do you need to like oh. and that's a really difficult question yeah. because like I thought I knew my path in high school. And so I followed it and spent way too much money in college on an orchestral degree to play in an orchestra and then realized two years after graduating from grad school that I don't want to play in an orchestra. So you take it from there. So, okay. So you're now talking to Christopher Bill, the upstate New York music teacher. Oh, wait, no. You're talking to the New York Philharmonic trombonist, Christopher Bill. Wait, no. 
Okay, I changed my mind again. Oh, the Broadway trauma. No, like I had so many paths and yeah, in college, the one that Mary alluded to, I, I, my freshman year, I was going to quit trombone and become a like write pop music. Um, and I had everything ready to switch majors. I talked to the Dean, everything. And then I just kind of had something click with, uh, with one of the trombone teachers at, at the school where it was just kind of like, you can still play trombone and do all these other things. And, and maybe classical music isn't the, the space for that, but you could still get a classical degree and learn a whole lot of good trombone playing in the process um, that will lead you other places. Uh, and that's when I looked into Broadway music. And uh, honestly, that's kind of the arranging style and everything. It, it went that direction. And then putting the videos out was never supposed to be a career. So. Uh, you know, when I started playing trombone on YouTube, you couldn't make money on YouTube. It wasn't a thing yet. So uh, obviously it wasn't a career idea. So had I had this decision that the question is, is asking about in high school or in middle school, I would have been a band teacher that always wished he performed or I would have been uh, a like burnt out trombonist trying to take auditions in the classical scene and not winning anything. Or I would have, you know, like, not deciding was actually what got me here uh, and kind of doing what worked, but also what I liked. So I would try and still try tons of stuff and whichever avenues are making money <laughs> was the, the main one at first. Like, okay, what, what's working to sustain myself on my music was the really the only thing I was worried about for a long time. And then once I was making money doing it, it's like, what, what do I like out of this stuff? Um, and letting that kind of decide my path. I'm sure everybody has a similar story here about that. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, um, one, man, if you asked me my senior year in high school, like I just wanted to be a band director. And I actually auditioned at, at one of the universities for my, for my, my uh, college auditions. The day of the audition, I switched it from like classical trombone to jazz trombone. And if you ask me my senior year coming out of my undergrad, I just wanted to be a straight ahead trombone player. But I say all of that to say, uh, I, I think that the more you learn just about the instrument and the, the music in general, you start to really shape and realize what it is that you actually want to do. I don't, I, I really don't think that you should ever try to put like a, a, a deadline on when you, when you've decided, all right, this is what it's going to be. Because for a long time, man, I just wanted to be in jazz at Lincoln center. And then I realized that's not all I want to do. Like, so what if that had been it, that it, it was just, Everyone knew me as TJ Norris, such and such trombone in jazz at Lincoln Center. And I never played with the Dirty Dozen, never got a chance to play any any of the bass stuff that I do. Uh, never did any other type of pop session work. So, I mean, you, you really just, I, I think the best thing is for you to, uh, the things that you're interested in right now, learn as much about them as you can, because that will also help you, it'll help lead you into a different direction. I never in my wildest dreams thought I would have been playing with a Dirty Dozen. However, I've been listening to them since I was in middle school. So it was like, oh, yeah, I actually know exactly how to do this. And and yeah, I would love to take this gig. You know what I'm saying? But before, I mean, really, if you'd asked me four months before, I would have never thought that I'd be a brass band trombonist either. That, that you know, that wasn't that wasn't my thing. But we're always yeah. in flux and, and you kept going, TJ, uh, <laughs> you know, as a funny note on the side. I wonder how many Pizza Huts and Taco Buenos and uh, and construction jobs and all that other stuff we did along the way to support our trombone habit. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I one time I was giving a math class to my students and I was I was thinking, you know, I could list all these things that were I had some success in it. OK, I said, would that tell the story? No, that wouldn't tell the story. So then write another list that's parallel with it. These are all my as Mugumi Candy says, my fails right and list all those things and then put all the subsidiary workplaces you know two years at taco bueno one year at rice mountain ski lodge telephone solicitation you know uh, i'm a graduate of three different pizza huts and and just okay you know that kind of tells more of the whole picture and we're not done yet yeah i i i but have I to agree with tj and and don on that too it's like we do so much you know i sit at a dispatch desk and occasionally fly airplanes to support the trombone habit. You know, it, it's just one of those things. Um, you know, it's, 
it's incredible. And also with TJ, like I, I was like, cool. I go to school in Georgia. I'm going to be a band director. I'm going to go to Jacksonville state university, like all the other band directors in Georgia. And we're going to go, you know, I'm going to go spend the next 30, 40 years of my life teaching band. And then I got my acceptance letter from Jacksonville state. And I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And so I, I vividly remember sitting on the back porch with my mom saying, I want to go major in jazz. I want to play jazz. And I was like, cool, I'm going to be like Irby Green. And I want to, I want to do that. I want to have that really silky smooth sound and do the whole thing. And then I, you know, fast forward a few years, I was like, I want to play swing era music. I want to play stuff of the late thirties. And then I got the call to play with the pickles and now I'm doing the thing. And now I want to get back into playing more classical trombone. So it's like this constant ever evolving thing. So yeah, and since we're all in the Phil Wilson fan club, best yeah. album. Nice. No, that's so, the best one. Yeah. Um, anyways, but yeah, fun times. We gotta yeah. bring things to close right now. Um, I, we're getting to the 12:30 mark, but I just wanted to close. Like what you're hearing from everybody right now is you kind of have to follow what you love doing and be pa what you're most passionate about. And I think the reality of that is that's what you're going to be most authentic about. Um, and I have to say, to bring Dennis with product into the discussion a little bit, aside from the beautiful background behind me, is that whenever anybody asks me how to find a mouthpiece, nice, Chris. <laughs> um, whenever anybody asks me about finding, you know, the right mouthpiece for them, my first thing is, the first thing I ask them is, what do they want to sound like? You know, what without a tone concept, you can't find the best mouthpiece for you because the best mouthpiece is going to create that sound right away. And I think that's so translatable to life, to everything you do, and especially your career. You know, what is it that you want to sound like right now? What is it? What is the tune of your life? And follow that. And it might change down the road. But I mean, all of us, I think whatever we're doing now, it's because we started doing what we love and doing what we love taught us you know, three other new skills, which took us to the next step. That wasn't exactly what that thing we loved, you know, a couple of years back. So, I mean, do I regret having spent a lot of money on two degrees in music performance to become an orchestral musician? Not really, because <laughs> I'm not doing it right now. I could have spent money in a lot of ways. Other way, I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now had I not started out on that path to become an orchestral musician, which I love. So I think all of us can say that right now. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, I will be in touch with you with a link to uh, the recorded version of the or the, the recording of this this uh, webinar. Um, we will be doing future webinars like this on specific subjects, and I will be starting some Facebook groups involving these um, artists for each instrument group. So if you'd like to continue the discussion in the future, just keep an eye on your inbox for the link and an and invite to the to the group. Um, but we've really enjoyed all of your questions. And last but not least, winner of the mouthpiece is Alan, Alan P. I won't say your whole name, but I will be in touch with you to send you a, a request for which mouthpiece you'd like. And uh, thank you so much to everybody who sent in questions. Um, it definitely allowed us to fill out this full hour and a half, although I feel like we could have gone for another hour after that. So until next time, thanks for joining. Happy holidays. Be safe and best. Download the Dennis Wick app. Uh, <laughs> The app. Do the app. Yeah, get it. <laughs> so we should have taken a bling pick with all of your mouthpieces. <laughs> mm. Next time. <laughs> yeah. Take care, y'all. All, all right, right. Bye, everyone. All right, great seeing you. Happy holidays. Right, thanks right, for doing yeah. this, Barry. Bye bye. Be safe, everyone. Please be safe. Yes. Yes.